Good morning, Grace Church, and welcome to Coffee with Colin. Uh, it's Wednesday morning. I hope your week's going well, and I hope you have a coffee to join with me for a few minutes as we just catch up on some things that are going around the church and maybe share a couple of things from God's Word. I've got a few announcements I want to uh, share with you this morning that I think are quite exciting. Um, I know many of you are joining us for Sunday morning at 1045, and I encourage you to join us at 1045 if that's possible, because it's a kind of a time when, uh, even though we're not together, we can join together at the same time uh, online and uh, have church together, worship the Lord together. So if you can do that, Sunday mornings at 1045, uh, don't use a closed church door as an excuse for not getting together with God's people. I would really encourage you to make that a priority. The second thing is, um, we're adding something new this Sunday, and I hope that uh, you will check your email. If you go to Grace and you're on the, on, the, on the email link, because at 10 o'clock this Sunday morning, we're going to have pre-service prayer uh, on Zoom, I think it is. So uh, for the details of that, you can follow your email or contact uh, our church office. Talking about our, speaking about our church office, I did want to give a shout out to uh, somebody special this morning, and that's uh, Janelle, who has been our administrative assistant for the last number of years. And uh, those of you who know Janelle, love Janelle and her family. I just want to say a big thank you, Janelle. It has been so much fun working with you. Um, you are the epitome of grace. Uh, not the church, but grace uh, itself. Uh, even though you're always busy, you always had a smile on your face, and I uh, am known to probably drive any administrative assistant crazy uh, with my tardiness and my lack of organization sometimes, and you would always come through with a smile and get another email out to the church or do something, you're very gracious and you're very long-suffering, and uh, we're glad we're not losing you to the church, but I know you got three little ones that keep you very busy in a full-time job, and it's just gotten to be too much. And we just want to say as a church, thank you so much. And uh, we're grateful, however, that um, Janelle was willing to stay on until we found somebody who could replace her. And I just want to let you know that Denise uh, has taken over that job. And uh, in a little bit of an expanded version, because of some of the uh, other needs that we've had, we've had to expand the job. And so Denise will be sending out emails. If you need to contact the church, you can contact Denise and uh, follow the link that comes uh, on your email. And that way you can get a hold of her. Denise is uh, qualified in just about every area of life. She's uh, great with people. She's great around the office. She's extremely organized and she forgets nothing. So anyway, she'll be an asset like Janelle was, and so uh, Janelle has left us in good hands. So welcome, Denise. We're glad to have you as well. And then uh, just a fourth thing, I just wanted to make a uh, mention of it, and that is that we've got a food, ch uh, a f a food uh, chain going uh, for uh, Christine and Lewis and family. Uh, some of you know that, uh, that Christine and Lewis's daughter Sharon, her husband, Sean, um, had a serious house fire this past week. And uh, so we've gotten together. We're putting together some meals and other things, ways we can help. If you're interested in that, please contact Denise, and she'll direct you the right way, the right place. <clears throat> There's one other thing I wanted to do this morning, and uh, that is some of you kind of wonder how all of a sudden we're online. Well, there's a reason. No, there's a person behind that, that question. And I want to ask him to come in here. I told him he wasn't getting out of it. Come here, Ovi, join me. In the studio this today, I've asked uh, Ovi to come in. And uh, <clears throat> Ovi was the brainchild behind all this when, when everything hit. And he said, Colin, he said, we can go online. We can do all this stuff. And, uh, and so he's gotten behind the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, photographing and all the AV stuff behind it. I don't know where he learned it all, but he's got it down pat. And uh, Ovi, thank you so much. It's been great. You've done an enormous service for the church, keeping us kind of together during this difficult time. Well, uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, 
it wasn't just me, it was also uh, Anton that helped and Wade. Uh, so huge thank you to, to them. So I want to ask you this question, Obi. How many times a week do we get together? Two times a week. How many times a week do we get together this week or were you busy this week? This week? Starting Saturday or starting Monday? I don't know what a week. Starting last week. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Obi, was, Obi had to do three different shoots this last week. How many hours do you spend per shoot? Traveling A lot of hours. <laughs> He's busy. He's, Obi probably puts in 10, 12 hours just putting together all this stuff. So I just wanted to get his face in front of you and say how much I appreciated uh, all that. Obi, what else are you doing for the church? You're working on something else. What is that? Yes, uh, we're working on a website, and that's coming up soon. It's very exciting. Uh, we'll be able to connect with everybody and uh, be able to share more information. Uh, we'll have an events. Everybody can stay connected. Also, we got an email address. It's going to be um, info at gracecommunity.ca. And uh, that's going to also bring us co closer, easier to get in touch. And yeah, look forward to that. So, always oh, done a lot to try to get us into the 21st century. And we appreciate that because, and I, I'm glad that Obi has so much time. <clears throat> Anything else going on in your life, Obi? Oh, um, there's this one little thing. Uh, I'm getting married this Saturday. <laughs> 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 and uh, as the whole church knows, we're so sorry. We wanted everybody to be there. But uh, due to these uh, unforeseen circumstances, uh, we were uh, forced to limit our uh, number of people we can invite to a very significantly smaller number than we planned to have. So we're so sorry that the Grace family is not going to be there. Well, we all understand, Ovi. And uh, just another little note that uh, Caitlin has just finished nursing school and uh, started a new job this last week in, uh, in a nursing home. And so besides all the other things that are going on and planning for a wedding, she started a new job, and this couple has just snowed under. So Grace family, if you would just pray for uh, Ovi and Caitlin, and especially surround them with your prayers as they commit themselves to each other before the Lord this coming Saturday, they would so appreciate that. In fact, Ovi, you need prayer. I do. I'm going to pray for Ovi right now, if you would just join me. Father, thank you so much for Ovi and Caitlin. I thank you for their lives. I thank you for their hearts, for their uh, commitment to sacrifice as they have, uh, Lord, especially over here these, this last while, putting together things for the church. Lord God, how I pray for your blessing on them. I pray that you will protect them, uh, especially, Lord, I think about uh, Caitlin as she works in the health industry, that you would guard her. I pray you will just help her as she, starts this, as she started this new job, uh, only five days before she gets married, that somehow, Lord, you would calm her. I pray that the peace of Christ would come over that wedding, Lord, and over their, their, uh, this coming week as they put uh, their lives together, and I pray you would be glorified. Lord, I pray that you'd be so present in their lives, they would, they would follow you and just know your gracious hand in their lives. We just commend them to your care. Father, we want to pray for uh, Christine and Lewis and, uh, and also <clears throat> uh, their kids, Lord, and the family, Sean and Cheryl. I pray for your, your blessing on them. I praise you, Lord, for protecting them in the fire. And I pray, Lord, for your blessing in their family that somehow you'd work out all these details and put their lives back together again. Father, there are those, uh, even this morning, who are listening, who are troubled, who are going through difficult times. Would you just surround them, Lord, by your grace and by your love and by your strength? I thank you that nothing takes you by surprise and that there's nothing too big for you. And I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to walk faithfully even in this pandemic that's going on, that we would trust you and we'd know the peace of Christ in the middle of it all. Thank you so much, Father, for your good people. And I pray you will bless, uh, bless us this week as we continue to seek to be faithful to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My wife has told me that I need to keep Wednesdays shorter. That I need not to preach a full message. She's probably right. I'll try not to take too much of your time this morning. But I just wanted to throw out a th couple of thoughts this morning uh, that come from the book of Philippians. Most of us have used the term, I changed my mind. And really what that means is that we've altered a plan that we had previously. We had a plan. We decided based on cir cir circumstances that we would do something different. And so we changed our mind about a thing. Like uh, some people probably said, I was going to get married to so-and-so, but 
I change my mind. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes maybe not. I was going to go to Mexico, but I changed my mind and I went to Hawaii. All of our children at some point in their lives say, when I grow up, I'm going to be a nurse or I'm going to be a fireman or a policeman. Sometimes that happens, but a lot of times along the way things occur and their kids change their minds. There are change agents that act on our lives. Maybe new information on a vacation spot. Instead of going to Hawaii, you need to go to Hope because you'd have to swim very well to get to Hawaii right about now because there are very few planes, if any, flying. <clears throat> Sometimes things are, so some things, some things change because of information. Some things change based on counsel. Maybe you're going to get married and somebody says, you know, I, I've met both of you, I've talked with both of you, and when I, I look at the two of you together, I don't know it's going to be a good fit. I mean, she's great and you're great, but I'm not sure you're going to be happy together and for these reasons, and so in the better part of wisdom, you change your mind. You agree that you're not going to get married. Sometimes it's counsel from others. And sometimes we change our mind just on emotion. We're hungry and we go out for a drive and we're going to go to Timmy's. And we get to a light and we go, no, I don't feel like Timmy's tonight. I don't feel like a coffee. I feel like ice cream. So instead of turning left, we turn right. It was just an emotional response, something that felt good. It's as easy as turning right instead of left. Some choices are not as simple or immediate. Some are not so short-term. They have longer-term results and consequences. And those oftentimes are the more difficult uh, changes in our lives. The greater the implication and the long-term results, the harder the decision is. You know one of the hardest changes I think I have to make? It's a heart change. I entitled this little few-minute talk this morning, <clears throat> How to Beat a Heart Attack. And the reason I say that is this. I mentioned last week that the Bible says that this world lies in the lap or under the control of the, of the evil one. I've never been more convinced of that. Uh, as I've thought about the world and I've thought about tragedy and trouble and, and destruction and all the things that go on, both in our world and in our lives. And I thought, you know, Satan really is alive and well. He is determined to destroy anything and anyone he can get his hands on. And so Satan, I really think, wants to attack our hearts. And some of you have been living together in confined spaces for weeks and maybe going on a couple of months now. And sometimes those relationships and that close proximity makes it a little bit difficult to get along. You know, that husband you always wanted to have home, you're desperately wishing he could go back to work. Maybe it's the kids that you wish could go to school. Maybe the kids are wishing they could go to school. Sometimes just being in close spaces, we start getting a little edgy. And I wanted to throw something out at you this morning. I think there's a couple of ways that Satan attacks our hearts. One of them is the problems that we face. That's one of the things. He brings problems into our lives and they become worries to us. We become anxious, we become troubled, and, and we don't know how to deal with them and we start nerdling and worrying and getting all worked up and, and sometimes those things have side effects, even in our relationships. I think the other area in which Satan attacks us, not only in our problems that are overwhelming, but people. The people around us, sometimes the people we love, who become very irritating. And that happens to all of us uh, when we live especially close to each other. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of God's Word, a little bit of counsel this morning. If you're struggling with problems or concerns or worries about what's going on, maybe you're struggling with people that you're dealing with. Uh, here's some, something that I need to think about personally. 
because I struggle with the same thing. But I, I called it God's prevention of a heart attack. God's prevention of a heart attack. Two things i got to show you in God's Word in Philippians in the fourth chapter. And I, I spoke to you about a couple of women who couldn't get along in the church in Philippi last week. And I just want to pick up from that section because I left a little part out that I really think is important. And I think in verses 6 to 7, Paul addresses how to deal with our problems. Instead of being all worked up and upset and, and troubled over, the whole, over things, he's got a, a solution for us if we will listen and apply it. And that is, he said, you need to transfer your problems. You need to transfer your problems. We walk along in life and problems dump on us and we hold them or they get on our back and, get, and that we carry them. And God says, you need to transfer them. If you continue to carry your problems, you will burn, burn out. You will be burdened and you will burn out. Here's, here's a little axiom. You can't worry about a problem you don't have. Did you know that? If you don't have a problem, you can't worry about it. Here's what Paul says in verse 6 of chapter 4 of Philippians. Be anxious for nothing. Here's the answer. But in everything by prayer and supplication or petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul says, if you don't want to have to live under the burden of your problems, you're going to have to give them away. And that's something most of us have such a challenge doing. We often take them to God's throne room. We tell them about them. Then we pick them up and we leave. As if our God is not capable of dealing with our problems. How ludicrous is that? And Paul says, for that reason, don't worry about stuff. But by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, take them through the throne room of God and leave them there. Because he's big enough to worry about them. So we don't have to. That's the first thing. Transfer your problems. And then the second thing, which really hits me, and which I really struggle with, and that is Paul says we need to transform our perspectives, especially of people. We need to transform our perspective. One of the things that we have to do is to take our problems and give them to somebody else and let them deal with them. But when we're dealing with people, although we can ask God for help, and He certainly will help us, there's something that we need to do, Paul says. And I find that in the next verses, verses 8 and 9, and that is, he says, we need to transform our perspectives, how we see people, how we look at people. And in this context of two women who can't get along, here's what Paul suggests. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, and I take it in the context of these relationships especially, maybe in all of life, but especially in relationships, these, these adjectives describe that. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything worthy of praise, meditate on these things. Let me back it up. If this really is about relationships, what Paul is saying is this. In conclusion, brethren, whatever things are true, I don't know what you're like, but I know when somebody gets under my skin, I start talking to myself about them. It feels so good. And you know what? I start, I especially focus on their motives. And I'm very good at discerning people's motives. Or at least so I think at the time. And by the time I'm done tarring and feathering them for their ugly motives, they are not worth knowing, let alone being allowed to live. Sometimes it seems. I can get myself so worked up. And a lot of the stuff that I think about them is very slanted. And really sometimes not even true. But in the emotion of the moment, I say things in my mind about them. 
And Paul says, you know what? Stop making things up. You know what I find? That when I've been out of fellowship with somebody and I finally get it right and get it back, get together with the person and confess my, my faults and, and, and we, we get back into fellowship, you know what? The whole picture of that person changes for me. And I sometimes go, how did I think that about that person? I think what Paul is saying is this, whatever is true, be honest. Don't make stuff up about people. Whatever is true, whatever is noble. And so Paul says, you know, whatever is noble, whatever is high-minded about a person, if it, makes the, if it makes the person look noble, well, think about that. Whatever is just or fair. Sometimes the things I, I, I look at, they're very, they're very lopsided like I said about the first part. And he said, you need to be fair. That's not quite true. Sometimes we say things even to other people about somebody else, and we limit it to the things that, that build our point, and we ignore all the rest of that person, all the valuable things. That's just not fair. And Paul says, you, need, you know what? You need to be fair. You need to be just. You need to be right in that. Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely. Is that a lovely picture of somebody that I think about? Not when I'm mad. He said, you need to stop those thoughts and you need to think about lovely things about that person. Whatever things are of good report. You know what I thought that was? I, I think a good translation or a paraphrase would be good gossip. He said, if there's any good report about that person, think about that. I kind of imagined um, going around and gossiping to other people about a person. Maybe somebody I'm a little bit irritated at. And, and telling them all the good things about that person. Have you ever tried that? I don't do it that well when I'm ticked off. But I've tried it when I'm not. And you know what? It is so much fun telling other people good things about a person behind their back. You need to try it if you haven't. It is so much fun telling how great this person is. It'll make you feel wonderful, but it's also great for the other person. It's kind of the God thing, you know. Whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, anything at all, if there's anything praiseworthy, well, meditate on these things. If you can find anything in a person that's valuable, that's praiseworthy, if you can find anything about what God is allowing in your life that's praiseworthy or valuable, meditate on that. Because how we think will be who we become. I can point to you bitter people that I know, and they are always complaining about something or someone. They have developed into a bitter person because of the way they thought. And Paul says, you know what? As God's children, we shouldn't be like that. So I want to encourage you today. Maybe you're going through a spot with, um, with a, a person or maybe in a, a, a situation. I want to encourage you not just to be a positive thinker. We don't have to be positive think, think, thinkers. We, we're far more than that because our God is absolutely in control. So we can be truthful thinkers, because as long as he is in control, I don't have to worry about people, and I don't have to worry about things. I can just love them. You know, it's interesting. I find uh, a couple of things. He says this. In verse 7, he said, if you give your problems to God, he says, the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you give your problems over to God, God will give you His peace. Isn't that a great exchange? In the next section, he says this, that if you transform your perspectives according to God's call, something else happens. You don't get the peace of God. He says... The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. Remember Paul? He was in Philippi, the people he's writing to, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the prison, singing songs and worshiping. Paul says, do what I do. He said, you know what I discovered? He said, not the peace of God will be with you. You already got that. 
but the God of peace will be with you. Not only do you get God's peace, but you get God himself. And that's a really great deal. A couple of years ago, my wife, uh, I don't know what I did, or which number of things I did, but she wasn't enjoying me very much. And I don't know what passage she read. I'm sure it was one of these, these passages. And she decided she would do what Paul said. And she began to write a list of all the reasons why she loved me. She didn't show it to me at the time. But one day we were in a good, good space. We were having a good time. And she said, you know, I don't know if I found the list. And she said, well, those are the things I wrote when I was really ticked off at you. And I read that I should think about these things. And so I began to write all the reasons why I loved you. And I think she ended up with like 30, 40 reasons. And she read those to me. And I have to tell you the truth. That when she was done, I wished I could meet that guy. Because in reality, it wasn't me. You see, I see the whole picture of me. But what my wife had done is picked out this thin sliver of good things that she had seen in the time when she was really not enjoying me very much. And she focused on those things. And it changed her entire life perspective. I want to encourage you, if you're having a tough day, if you're having trouble, t t trouble with the things that are going on in your life, I want to encourage you to dump your problems in the throne room, leave them with God and take away his peace. If you're having trouble with people, can I encourage you to spend the day, maybe write a list of all the reasons why you love or care about that person and let the, let the God of peace change your heart. Well, thanks for joining me on Wednesday. For Coffee with Colin, I hope you have a great day and a great rest of the week. And we'll see you for prayer at 10 o'clock next Sunday morning online. God's blessings.